Welcome to Kingdom of the Longest, a Christian program of critical thinking and adventure. Today we're going to be discussing the Chinese church, a theology of love, and some philosophy on will. This program is created by Christian ministers. I am Pastor Amanda Sparrow, and in the studio with me is... J. Dylan Proctor. And, and also... <laughs> and I'm Anthony Alegria. And please, send us your things. Yes, we have a fantastic meme we're going to show you um, about a conversation between God and an angel. Um, and basically, the justice God says, what are you? Do- what are they doing down there? The angel's response is they're making milk from almonds. And God's like, what? I gave them like eight animals to get milk from. The angel's response is they don't like that milk. God mockingly um, with lots of weird uh, words uh, says they don't like that milk and then flips the table. Yeah, the, the image <laughs> of God flipping the coffee table. I don't know if it's like blasphemy or it's hilarious, um, but go ahead and send us your pitchforks. Um, there's always reasons for that. And a big question I have for you is how excited are you to go to church? Are you as excited to go to church as this pug is? Buddy, you want to go to church? You ready to go? That pug is super excited to be to, at PetSmart, and I, I gotta say, I really wish that I was that happy about anything. Um, pugs are one of those things where people either crave them or they don't. I don't know. They're what they are. Anyways, um, before we get into China, the Journey Joe, thank you for the comments. They sent us one that says, this looks awesome, keep it up. And Catholic Passport says, beautiful. And that statement was in response to a meme of Teresa de la Sue, and we'll get to that later. All right, so... Let's have a serious conversation about what is going on with the church in China. This is a conversation I really want us to have because it's something where the more you hear about it, the more this needs to be a broad attention to the world because there's some really serious things going on. So recently we've talked a little bit about the three self church in China, which is the official church in China. Yes, China actually has a government run church. But aside from that, there are also other home churches which are there. So basically the church in China really fits in a few categories. There is a Catholic presence there. There's a Protestant presence there. There's sort of a non-denominational home church that is there. And then there's the official state-run church. And recently, China has been working to shut down churches, including those that are run by the government. Furthermore, the Protestant churches and the home churches have been heavily persecuted and have been put in really terrible positions. Even the Catholic church has recently been put in a weird position, and the Vatican made a deal with the Chinese government that kind of bothers me. And I want us to talk about that a little bit. Before we get to the one involving the the Catholics, I want to talk about shutting down the church Zion, which is the largest house church in China. So when we say house church, we think of something a little different than what people might think of in China. Amanda, would you share with us a little bit what really is a house church? What are we talking about when we talk about that in China? All right. So China has an officially recognized church called the Three Self Church or the Four Self Church. Um... And that is their, their, their government sanctioned body. And so everyone outside of that is considered a house church. And they're also considered um, to be illegal or at least under great suspicion. And so a house church can definitely be a couple of believers meeting in a home or an apartment. Um, but it can even be a larger gathering of people in a, uh, in like an area that's been rented out specifically for the church. Um, but when we say house church, it just basically means any body of believers that is not part of the organized and sanctioned uh, Church of China. Yes, it, it really doesn't mean that it's just a something happening in someone's home, though that could be the case. It really just means not the official church. Well, recently there has been the church, which is under the name Zion, which is there in China, and it's been one of the recently attacked churches there in China. And basically what happened is in April of this year, The Chinese government sent a letter to the Zion Church and said, we want to install CCTV cameras all throughout your building. We want them watching everything that goes on. We want full access to your your building and activities all the time. And now, of course, this sounds like Big Brother coming to be inside your church, and it actually is that. It's actually the government wanting to come in there for nefarious reasons. Now, as you can imagine, Zion, they were a little bit hesitant to comply with this. And as a result, the Chinese government basically said, well, we're going to shut you down if you, you don't do this. And as we've seen with other churches, and we've talked about this in the past, there's been a theme where the Chinese government and President Xi has been coming in and saying, all the churches do away with the crosses. No more Bibles, no more crosses. If you have religious imagery or religious material, we want that replaced with the 
Communist Party material. We want socialist propaganda in there, although they don't necessarily call it socialist propaganda. They doubtright say we want pro-socialist things posted all over the place. They want these to replace what is going on with the, the actual activities of the church. But what I find to be so dubious about this, and we have an article from Christianity Today on this, and it's we've got that pulled up so you can see a few of its pictures and things. One of the really dubious things the Chinese government has been doing is as the church refused to comply with this, the state sent some officials here and basically they said, we want you to call up the workplace of people in this congregation and harass them until you can get them to make a statement to get them to comply with this standard that they will not go to church anymore. So basically they've been going to the workplace of people who attend this church and harassing them, wanting statements that they will not go to church, that they'll cease going to church, they'll cease being Christian. And it is just a really, really terrible thing. They're trying to, to get the church out of the building where they're meeting. They're trying to evict them and shut them down. We've got some, some pictures of both the church and, and the pastor there. His name is Ezra Jean of Beijing's Zion Church. And you see this man here. Again, he's got a lot of weight on his shoulders, as do all the Christians in this scenario. If you can just imagine... We're at a place where by the, the mercy of God, we have the freedom to, to go in and worship together and assemble with, with the other believers. And even right now, listening to this podcast, having a Christian conversation, we have great liberty in doing that. But in China, they're being deprived of these very basic rights. And I know that's something that really bothers you, Amanda. Yeah, I, we've talked about it again. We've kind of mentioned this before, but this is a basic human right. And this is something kind of collectively as a world, we've sat down together and we've written down what is every human being entitled to. And we're and one of those things is freedom of religion. And, and it's even ingrained in how we're supposed to do business internationally and nationally. And the fact that there, it's not like, this is not like it's a secret incident. It's not something we have to go investigate really deep into to find out it's happening. This is fairly common knowledge. Yeah. And 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 for it to be happening and happening so blatantly, I think speaks to the fact that our world, even though we say these are basic human rights and we're going to fight for these basic human rights, we're going to hold people accountable and governments accountable for these human rights, we're not actually going to follow it through. Um, and, and obviously, we, I mean, this is a very clear example why we shouldn't trust the government um, for salvation or protection or really anything. Um, but this is not a political rant. This is a rant of, 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 well, grief that there are fellow Christians that are experiencing these things and they don't have the tools or the structures or really the support of others to, to, to change this. And it just it's just horrifying that this is going on and this is going on in our modern day and it's going on so blatantly. It really bothers me how much the especially the a lot of the American and Western media doesn't spend a lot of time covering this because it's it's a pretty serious thing. This does mimic some very serious things in history because the mechanism of replacing God with the state is pretty evil. And one of the things which is really novel about the American system is we come in and we said the rights we have, they are not of our own design, but instead they come to us from divine, divine providence. In other words, they originate from God. And the government is there just to protect these rights which come from God. And that's a very important philosophy that really comes out of the, the Christian world, but also it's one that thousands of years of, of human civilization, we have come together to realize this is the best recipe for freedom. This is the best recipe for people actually getting their rights. And when we see what's going on in China, where they are, they're not allowing people to have this freedom of expression. There's no freedom of speech. There's no freedom to worship God. They're wanting to replace even the imagery. They're wanting to replace God with themselves, the Communist Party. It really is a devastatingly bothering thing, to put it nicely. Another uh, issue that's happened recently, which of course we're all clergy in the Church of the Nazarene, or myself and Amanda are, and Anthony's getting there. Anthony's doing a great job producing. But here in recent times, the Catholic Church just made a deal with China that sounds really good if you just read it as a headline, but when you get past the headline, it's actually pretty terrible. So recently what happened is the Catholic Church, which again, previously, the Chinese government did not recognize it. Earlier, Amanda was talking about how if you're not the official church, you're basically a house church and not recognized. Well, previously, the Catholic Church was not recognized there in China. They're not the official church. But the Vatican just brokered a deal with the Chinese government. And it basically reads like this. The Chinese appointed bishops are now recognized. And in return, the Chinese party recognizes the Vatican as the head of the church. 
Now you read that and that might sound cute and fuzzy, but it's actually quite dubious because basically what has happened now is the Vatican said, if you will say that I, the Pope, I'm the head of the church, we'll let you appoint the bishops there in China. We won't be doing anything in that capacity. You can appoint the bishops. We previously had excommunicated the bishops that you had there because they were assigned by you. But now we'll step back. As long as you say on paper that we're the head of the church, we'll let you pick the people to be the pastors and the bishops. That's really really a dubious thing because obviously China has a motive not to put people in ministry who want to be in ministry. They have a really corrupt motive there. And I don't think the Vatican is actually the head of the church if the Chinese government is the one pointing. So Amanda, what are your thoughts? Yeah, right. So this is, this is not something like this is what, when uh, Dylan, Pastor Dylan first shared the story with me, I was like, this seems odd because like the Catholic church has a lot of power in the world. I mean, influence and money and, and tradition behind them if any denomination was going to be like we are in charge it would be the catholic church and so this seems odd to me the catholic church was real was willing to surrender power to a, a secular government and, and what also amazes me is again if we give this just more than like two sec seconds of thought and really think about this it, it's saying you know, the Chinese government's not going to go to a seminary or, or a college, uh, a Bible college and say, we want to pick the, you know, the smartest and the brightest theologian. And that's who we're going to appoint as a bishop of the Catholic Church. No, because <laughs> they've obviously already said they want to crush Christianity. You know, they're going to say, hmm, who's the most in favor of the party line? You're going to be a bishop. And this is so obvious. If if we could figure this out, and, and I'm not diminishing our intelligence, but we're just two people from Nashville, like, of no power and no social standing. If we can figure this out, how can the freaking Pope not get this? And maybe he does and doesn't care. I don't that, know. That's the thing which really bothers me. And I, I, I love the hierarchy of the church, the Nazarene, but it bothers me when there are people who are more interested in a narrative than actually standing up for the truth. Because again, now the Pope can have this nice headline that says, oh, well, we brokered a deal with China. It's all wonderful. We've got a great narrative, but the reality is pretty corrupt. And, and I also want to say, we're not picking on the Catholic Church. There are many great ministers and people who, who follow the, the Catholic tradition, but we have got to do something more than just make nice headlines if we're going to impact the world. I think actually we, we may just need to, to shut down the whole program. I think that statement basically <laughs> wraps up everything. Just nice, do something that's not just nice headlines. That basically sums up all of our um, political issues in the world, right? <laughs> social issues, spiritual issues, everything. Just don't look for the headline, look for the, the virtue itself. Um, look for the gospel. This is not even like the 1800s. I know when we were getting ready for the show, we were talking about in the 1800s, a lot of times people like Baptist theology, a lot of the Sola Scriptura denominations. And here, Sinister your pitchforks. Go ahead. <laughs> um, they would go to different places. And when they would go to, maybe they were going to different places in the South, places that had slaves, they would want to start churches. They would say, well, who's the most charismatic? We'll put that one to be the pastor. Maybe they went to a town that didn't have a church. They would say, well, find the most charismatic person there. Let him be the pastor. We don't have to send him to school. You found that a lot in the Baptist derived denominations, whereas the Methodists were more like, no, we've got to get these people and educate them. And so the Baptist denominations, they exploded really quickly because they didn't have standards to <laughs> on who would be ministers. Ooh, all the pitchforks. Now. Oh, all the pitchforks in them. But it's the, it's the true history of this. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why the fundamentalism and the not so scholarly denominations blew up in America is because when they came down with their missionaries, they would say, well, just get people behind the pulpit who are charismatic and the Methodists and the people who were more aligned with, you know, send people to school, get them educated. You know, it takes them several years to turn out a minister where the other people can do it in a day. And, and you found that the church grew accordingly. And this isn't even that level. Right. This isn't even the They're level. They're not even of, trying to find the most charismatic Christian. Just yeah. the, the most, person <laughs> and it's it really bothers me and again just for some final details about the church in china the official church is the three self patriotic movement which stands for self-support self-governance and self-propagation and you'll notice there's a lot of the word self in there because it's all inward focused it china wants to be in control of it they don't want to have anything outside of it in control of it and you might ask the question it's a rational question why does the chinese government even have an official church if they hate christianity the answer is easy 
you can control it if you're the one who sets the parameters of it. They wanted to eradicate the gospel, and in the 1970s, they realized the house churches were doing right well. And they said, well, if we open up our own church, we can better control Christianity by having our own church. They're not there because they love the church and want to be a state sponsor of it. They're there because they hate the church, and they think that if they can have an official church that they can control, they can control the gospel. Anyways, um, final thoughts on this conversation. I just think it's just it's frustrating and and it's aggravating as we talk through it but again um prayer is not the sunday school answer it's not the easy answer i think but it's something we really have to be devoted to in supporting our brothers and sisters um who are in china and supporting those who have gone there to to proclaim the gospel in the midst of such persecution anthony i was actually pretty much going to say the exact same thing i was going to say that uh, you know, we need to pray and that we should also remember uh, the ministers that are sent there. Absolutely. Pray for the Christians in China, the ministers in China. They're, the church is doing surprisingly well. You'll actually find this is historically true. Whenever the church is being crushed by some government, it tends to do really well. But I know I'd say final thoughts on this topic from everyone else, but I want to bring up something really quick. Recently, I was listening to a conversation with Sebastian Gorka, who has done a lot of analyzing both military and various intelligence um, affairs of the world. And he was saying of all the threats that we have in the, the earth, it's not something like radical terrorism or anything of that, but it's, it's really the, the party there in China, this communist party. And of course, this isn't because of the Chinese people who were the largest victim of, of this um, communist party, but it's the few people who were there controlling this that are in charge of this and they're they're really doing some dubious things. And I know I had wanted us to move past this conversation, but there's something I want to bring up if that's okay with mm-hmm. everyone. There's a movie that came out a few years ago and because this is a family show, I can't say the name of it, but it's called Inglorious B Words is the only nice way to say this. And there are several things about this movie which really bothered me. And some of those things that Inglorious B Words did that really put me over the edge was the fact that it repainted history. It, it told a f- historical, fictitious story. So it, it took historical events and then it added fiction into it. Basically, the movie takes place in Nazi era, World War II, and Hitler is killed in a movie theater by a young Jewish girl who is there in the theater and some, some Americans who have sort of an elite team who are just like total hard booties who go out and have really no moral standards. And what I hated about this movie wasn't so much that it was historical fiction, though I think there's some problems there. And again, I'm not trying to say we should censor this movie, but it suggested one that Hollywood and theater is the antidote to Nazism, which I think that's a little bit posh on Hollywood's point to say that. But it also (laughs) presented this idea that you can rebrand Nazism at your convenience. They wanted to make Nazism to be something a little bit more shallow than what it was, sort of this generic evil that's kind of lowbrow evil. And therefore, because you're dealing with a lowbrow, unintelligent evil, you can just be as crude and immoral as you want to because you're up against a crude and immoral enemy. And I think that is also totally inaccurate because Nazism was quite developed. Um, It was highly developed. And one of the things that was going on in Nazi Germany, of course, was they wanted to replace all the religious imagery, whether it be in schools, something like prayer, crosses. They wanted to tell preachers they couldn't speak. That was something that happened. People like Dietrich Bonhoeffer were officially told they couldn't speak. They would go out and they would silence ministers. They would silence theologians. And they would replace the images of the church with different images of, say, Hitler. They wanted the Nazi flag in there. And one of the things which is also really important for us to understand about what happened in Nazi Germany is Nazi Germany was creating a new reality. They were creating a new religion. They had entire departments of the government devoted to creating a new religion. You have people like Joseph Goebbels talking about, we are creating a new religion. The only thing we're missing is our really mode of salvation. One of the things which fascinates me is people, they water down Nazism to say it's, oh, it's just a generic lowbrow racism. Where the racism of the Nazis was not what people think of today when they think of racism. The Nazis, they hated the Jews in particular. And one of the reasons I think this is true is because No matter where you're at theologically, the Jews have been the flesh and blood representation of the people of God, the God of Israel, the God the Father. They hated that. 
the Nazi socialist ideology was the new God. And like all things which are polytheistic, it has no unified moral code. You've got the party, which is sort of the overarching God. Then below that, you've got the head figure who might be Adolf Hitler at one point in time. It might be somebody else later. And you've got different layers of layers of morality, which means, you know, you can treat your enemies different than how you treat your friends. You get this sort of dualistic view of the world that you get with polytheism. And instead of being something low and unsophisticated, which is what Inglorious B where it's portrayed it as, it was a massive evil that wanted to replace God. And when we look at what's going on in China, it's actually, I think, a fair comparison. A lot of times people say everybody that I disagree with is a Nazi. I think if you actually look at what's going on in China and North Korea, these are the closest things you find in the modern world. It's different. I'm not saying, I'm not making that comparison because to make that comparison sheds too much gray area and distinguishing these two as being independent things. They are definitely independent evils. And China, the Chinese government, the Communist Party, it, it has evil there in its own right. And we should be aware of it and, and watch it for what it is, it is. And we have to confront it accordingly. Any final thoughts? Again, second time. On <laughs> second time. I do think, sorry, I said no, I don't have a final thought. And then I did. Um, earlier you were talking about in the movie um, that you're referencing that basically the antidote is propaganda and to fight propaganda. And I think that's just kind of a funny way of, of handling things. Or like if you have a lowbrow enemy, then you can be lowbrow. Or just like to think that somehow we can stoop to the level of evil to conquer it. It's just such a ridiculous logical train of thought or illogical train of thought. Um, and so, yeah, we do have to find something better, something stronger, um, something more if we're going to defeat the evil in our world. And it's not going to be to stoop to their level. Absolutely. You know, if, if you've, you've come inside and we recently, we had a craft fair here and people would make cookies and things. If you spill chocolate kip cookies on you and you get... <laughs> dirt all over your nice white shirt you know is the antidote more chocolate more, <laughs> cookies? Do, you, more mess. Do, you, do you go and get like a caramel cookie to get that off <laughs> you've got to have something cleansing when there's evil going on in the world you've got to have something cleansing if you want to to get that out the antidote isn't more lowbow garbage it's not your brand of it if you want to create a society that can come out of those ruins you've got to have something better than that all right we'll end that conversation there <laughs>